Now I've been told that the key to productivity is a clean workspace, but I've also heard that geniuses always have messy workspaces. So either geniuses never got anything done or nobody knows what the hell they're talking about. Now normally the goal would be to have a nice clean well-lit workspace, everything laid out in a specific orientation, but we're coming up on I really don't care o'clock. So we're just gonna run with what we have. The idea here is instead of just making one base video about Jeep Electrical or CJ Electrical, we're actually going to tackle each individual item. But before you can really start troubleshooting, you need to know what tools you have to have as well as just a basic idea of how automotive electrical works. Now, if you're an electrical engineer, this will be boring to you. And if it feels like I'm teaching to the lowest common denominator, I'm not trying to make anybody mad. I'm just trying to make sure that everybody learns at the same pace. I'm going to keep this real simple, and you won't even have to know who Edison or Tesla are. And when I talk about Tesla, I don't mean the current company, nor do I mean the band. I actually mean the crazy guy who wanted to make a giant death beam. So actually, yeah, maybe I'm talking about the current Tesla. Okay, so let's get started. First of all, the electricity in your car works like this. And let's see if I can put a little picture here. We'll see how well I can do in post. Your vehicle has a battery in it. That battery is rechargeable and it is recharged by an alternator. The engine moves your car forward, backwards, like it's supposed to, but the rotation of all those belts runs what's called an alternator or what used to be a generator. The idea is that little thing has a sensor in it and when the voltage gets low in the car, it kicks in and charges the battery, and once it's charged, it leaves it alone. Now, what does this matter? Well, here's what I need to explain and what you have to understand first thing when you were gonna troubleshoot one of these Jeeps. No electrical object will work unless electricity can actually get through it. This is a remote, a remote that runs on batteries like your car starts on batteries, this needs a battery to function. Now, every battery has a positive and a negative side. The positive is the little bumpy part. If I just simply push the positive terminal into the remote, it won't work, and we all know that. Anyone who's ever dropped a remote and had the battery pop out part ways knows it won't work. You have to have the negative and the positive in contact for it to work because the key to a functioning circuit is it has to be a circuit. It has to be able to flow. That's all you need to know about electrical. As long as you have flow when you were troubleshooting, as long as you understand that concept, you're gonna be okay. Now to further lock in this concept, let's just take a look at a standard light bulb. This is a bulb that you would find in any vehicle. On the bottom, is the little post where electricity goes in and around the sides here is actually where it grounds. When you put this into its little holder, those little pins lock in and that is what gives it a ground. So here's the idea. Electricity goes in through the bottom and then it runs through the filament. Electricity wants to go through as fast as possible. The filament offers resistance. Think friction. And what do you get with friction? Well, you get heat and in the case of electricity, you get heat and light. Now I could put electricity to the bottom of this, 12 volt, all day long, positive, all day long, as much as I want. But unless it can actually get through the filament and get out, it won't do anything. And that's why a lot of the problems you run into are going to be ground related. Yes, you might test it and there's power going in, but when it comes down to it, unless that power can get back out, you're kind of stuck. Now we'll go into it in more depth, of course, depending on what we're working on, but that's the general concept. Keep that in mind. Now you do need some tools when you start doing this and troubleshooting, but it's not like it's really that expensive of an endeavor. The first thing you're gonna need is a test light. What a mess. Varying a price from extremely cheap to uh, stupidly overpriced. This is a Matco unit, which I have and has a very long probe on it, um, but obstructs the light bulb for like 60% of the test light. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, not that useful. Here's how a test light works. There's a little light bulb in it. I connect this to a ground and I touch this to what should be hot. If it is indeed hot, 
the light bulb turns on. That's how we're able to find if something is hot or not. Connect this to a ground, touch this into where a fuse should be, or into the receptacle for a light bulb where the post is making contact, and if this lights up, that means there's electricity going to it. Test light, super simple. Not to be confused with continuity meters. You can tell what a continuity meter is because it's gonna have a battery in it. All a continuity meter does is make sure that there is power traveling from, or not power, it makes sure that there's an uninterrupted connection. So right now, if I put this thing to its end, you'll see it lights up. If I take this piece of wire, clip one into it, and then touch the other end, it lights up. What it's telling me is there's a good continuity. There is an uninterrupted connection in this wire. Now these are good, but we're gonna trump this in a moment. You're going to need wire cutters or dikes. Um, decent pair will serve just fine. As long as it actually gets the wire cut in one stroke, you're gonna be good. Crimpers, if you were working with connectors. Now the important aspect of these is they're going to make sure to close those little connections and squeeze onto the wire. This is a butt connector. Oh wait. Did you get it out? Good. Basically what you do is butt two wires into each other. So how these work is you place them in the correct part of your crimper, like so. Place them over a wire. Make sure the wire goes all the way in and then squeeze. That should crush it and make sure it doesn't come out. Now in a perfect world, you could solder or solder, depending on what terminology you want to use, every connection. But the truth is, for the most part, this will handle 95% of the stuff you need to do. So don't stress about it. Just make sure you have a decent pair of crimpers. Wire strippers. Now you don't have to buy the fancy, stupid, overpriced Matcos. I'm pretty sure I bought these for 12 bucks. But if you plan on doing any wiring beyond a couple, uh, unless you want to play the go around in circles with the cutters and then push with your thumb and then hope you get it off and you don't take any copper out of the center, then you might want to get a set of these because they're just going to do it automatically for you. Another nice thing about these is if I want to splice in a wire instead of cutting this wire or using Satan's little plastic blue clippy things, and if you know what I'm talking about, I, I hate them so much they're not even in the shop. You can just go in the middle of the wire, use these, strip the wire, and then you can poke a little hole and just splice right into it. So these are really good to have. It's going to make your life a lot easier. If you choose to rely on these, you're just going to make more work for yourself. Uh, for instance, on this one, if I want to cut a wire, I actually have to open the handle and put it over the wire because the cutter's right there. They're always loose. None of these things ever match up. You have to make sure you match your wire gauge. It's, eh, these are garbage. Here's where everybody's brain kind of breaks, and it comes to multimeters. Multimeters do multiple functions, but really all you need one of these for is two things. One, the ability to actually measure voltage. So if I probe a battery right now, it'll tell me what the volts is, such as 12.3, blah, blah. And also continuity. Remember that little light bulb filled thing that touched itself and illuminated? Well, this does the same thing, except it gives you audio feedback. So when it's set on audible continuity, it will beep. I don't know if you can hear that but it's beeping because the probes are touching. This is basically how we're going to be able to test two ends of a wire or of a connection and make sure the connection's good. A lot of people don't use the continuity aspect of their multimeter. Uh, it's actually a really useful tool. So, you know, mess around with it, obviously. We're gonna go over how it works. You don't have to pay an arm and a leg or go down to Lowe's and, or Home Depot or buy the Bosch one at O'Reilly for $80. You can find these for 15 bucks cheap at Walmart and they will do exactly the same thing. Just make sure they do 12 volt DC and do continuity, preferably audibly. Some do continuity, but they won't beep. And the beeping is the easy, easy way to go.
Now back to those connectors. As I said, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to use little cheater connectors like this, but sometimes it's just the easy way. These are butt connectors. These are also butt connectors. They're in different colors. The different colors denote that they are different sizes because wires come in different gauges. For instance, these little blue ones are 16 to 14 gauge. So depending on the gauge of wire you have, you will use a different connector. For the most part though, these blue ones, the 16 to 14, is what you're gonna use 80% of the time. Unless you're working on something that's carrying a really thick wire for power, or I don't know, an aftermarket winch or something like that, these are gonna handle most of what you need to do when you gotta butt two wires together. This is a male connector. This is a female connector. I sincerely hope I don't have to explain that any further. You will find a use for both of these. This might be the back of a light or a switch. This might be actually going into your fuse box. So you're going to need a package of these. Mm. I do find that I probably use these more often, installing switches and relays and things like that. But I do like to have a pack of those when I need to go into a fuse box. And as you start doing more and more stuff, you'll need different size butt connectors. You'll need little ring thingamajiggies. You'll need those. And in fairness, just go on Amazon and find uh, an assortment pack and order it. And it's a lot cheaper than going to the auto parts store. So in conclusion, quick recap. The tools you need, relatively inexpensive, easy to use. And I will explain them as I use them throughout the video. The basic idea that you need to have is for anything electrical to work, Electricity has to get in and it has to get out. That's just the way it is. That's how it works. So as I start going through these things, you're going to see what I'm testing for as I explain it. And I really hope that this helps some of you because I know that every Jeep owner has had an electrical issue. Let's take all this crap and over the course of uh, Lord knows how many videos, show you how to use it. Now we're going to do everything. We're going to do turn signals, we're going to do marker lights, we're going to do brake lights, we're going to do backup lights, we're going to do the four-wheel drive indicator light, we're going to do the brake indicator light on the dashboard, we'll do the gauge cluster, we'll do all of those things. So please bear with me, because even though the video is kind of long, the prep and the editing, it, it takes time, and I don't always have that time. So do not expect a new video every Tuesday. Um, but Thanks to everybody that subscribed, because I just checked and I saw that it's like 180 people. Actually, it looks like it might be 181. Thank you, Mr. Brendan Finn Sr. Anyways, I feel like if that many people are subscribing, then obviously I have something helpful and I might as well keep it going. So even if one of you finds this useful, it was definitely worth it. And uh, it's hopefully gonna save you some money in the long run because the people who pretend to be rocket scientists that will troubleshoot these problems for you and charge you an insane amount of money hourly, eh, don't let them fool you. A lot of it's pretty simple stuff.